Well, my birthday is May 3rd, 1934, so I just turned 81. I was born in the town of Saramban in the state of Negri Sembilan in Malaya, now called Malaysia. Actually, I didn't realize how significant the atrocities were until when I was studying at Yale, when I was learning about Southeast Asian history and the professor who was teaching me happened to experience the Japanese occupation in Indonesia and I started to think back about my experience with the Japanese occupation. I remember that Japanese dropping bombs and about the hardship of food and survival and um, how difficult it was. And that's when I started to say to myself that I should read up something about this. And that's how I started to think about the war. Quite a lot of Chinese in Singapore, maybe about 10 to 15,000 at least. And in Malaysia, another, you know, 10,000 from my own state alone. And uh, whenever I read stories about such accounts about the Japanese occupation, you never get any honest report. And I decided that if I have a chance, I would like to write something about the truth and I would like them to at least admit that they have wronged the people of Southeast Asia, not only Malaya, but uh, they started in China and then they applied the same tactics of killing that they did in, 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 in Nanking, Nanjing and then the general who started that in Nanjing moved to Singapore and he used the same tactics to move further north to Malay, to the Malay Peninsula and started massacring the Chinese. And the Chinese have always been in the black books of the Japanese. And to this day, they still say that there was no rape of Nanjing in China. And that part I don't like. <laughs> The first paper that I wrote was on the Tiger Under the Rising Sun. I entitled the paper Tiger Under the Rising Sun because at that time the tiger was a symbol of Malaya and the rising sun was Japan. So I thought at least if the content is not that uh, attractive, the people will see what is under the rising, the tiger under, the, they may think it was an exciting hunting trip so they may get to read it. So then they will know something about it. And then I wrote a more important paper, which I wanted really the politicians, people in the UN to see it at the massacre of the Chinese in Singapore and Malaya during the Japanese occupation. And there I went into great detail, you know, revealing the atrocities that the Japanese did, mainly in the peninsula in my home state where in a period of two weeks they have killed over 5,000 people with the bayonet <laughs> and burned the buildings and homes of these innocent people. So, and uh, some of the survivors of that incident even appeal to the UN and the UN has no jurisdiction over it and today there have been no apology from the government about this. So I hope that uh, it will catch some of the decision makers. If you look at world history, the Germans have admitted their fault in their killing of the Jews during the Second World War in the gas chambers. And they have made amends with the 
the, 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 the Israelis in Israel, the Jews in Israel, and they have accepted that the Germans have apologized to the Jews and there's political relation, but the Japanese have never extended this kind of apology to China, Korea, or Southeast Asia, Singapore, and Malaya. Singapore was very badly tortured. Our late Lee Kuan Yew almost got killed in the massacre, except that he was quick-minded enough to say that he forgot his bag and went to get it, but never came back to the camp where he was detained. So he wrote that in his autobiography. So what more can you do? And when they interviewed him, how many people were killed in Singapore? They still, the, the Japanese still were not very willing to accept his figures. I was <clears throat> just turning eight years old. And uh, in fact, I started schooling just before the war. I lived with my parents, father and mother, and a step-uncle, eight brothers and sisters, grandmother, my father's mother, and a servant who was with us for many years. Actually, the bombing of Malaysia started in 1941. I did not know it was the war, but then one day, my father came home and said, we better get ready to move because the Japanese are bombing the town. And I heard bombs and planes flying over the roof of our house. And uh, then he gathered all of us together and put us in a small car and started to take us to a rubber estate, which was about five to six miles away from our home. And then he made trips, several trips to take all of us to this rubber estate. And I could hear planes flying above, bombing. And then my father was driving us to the rubber estate and then returned to the home and then took three people at one time because the car could only sit two persons and put some belongings at the back of the car. And this rubber estate belonged to one of our relatives. And so we were all living in the rubber plantation. Sometimes somebody would say, go away, go away, let's go, because the Japanese are coming. And sometimes the Japanese trucks would come to the farm and we have to go into hiding. And when the Japanese come, they would take chicken, ducks, and whatever food you have, and then they would drive away. It was difficult for my father. He was at that time also a volunteer to the civilian government. At the same time, he has to help the government to maintain order in the place for people so that there will be no chaos. And at the same time, trying to move out, out of the place where we were staying. <laughs> we stayed in the rubber estate for a short while. And then later on, we moved into the jungle. My father thought that it may be safer to move into the jungle. And uh, there was a house that belonged to some friends. And we stayed in the jungle. And in the jungle, it was all surrounded by fences because at night there were tigers <laughs> in the jungle. And you can hear t t tiger cries and making noises and lots of monkeys. And uh, at that time, we, we did not know how difficult. We just went wherever my father asked us. And it was not easy to live in the jungle. In the jungle, I remember that we learned to grow food. We planted maize, potatoes, tapioca, and we use a system of what they call shifting cultivation. That means you burn some trees down and then you dig the soil and then you plant maize on the soil. 
and then you plant tapioca and then you take a hoe and dig the soil and then plant some sweet potatoes so you grow your own food and uh, we had a well the well was not the best it was quite full of iron minerals the water sometimes turned almost red <laughs> and uh, then we started to use river water and it was when using river water that some of the members of my family got malaria and that was bad and we had no medicine so we have to cut the bark of the Sincoda tree to dry it and then boil it as tea for people with malaria it is from this Sincona bark that the quinine was made it didn't stay there for long but, mm -hmm. but after law and order was well, was maintained we moved back into our old place when we moved back into our old house we found that there was some system of government the Japanese appointed generals as representatives to work side by side with the Malay sultans and then they set up a local administration council with a mixture of Malays, Chinese and Indians and Japanese soldiers you know maintaining the peace in the town they, there's a police station with policemen but they were all Japanese soldiers and we didn't live too far away from the police station and every time when we came into town we have to pass by the police station and we have to bow to the police men on duty at a 45 degree angle because if you don't bow down to him he would even try to bayonet you and if he missed it the bayonet will get right into your stomach my father <clears throat> got some what they call TOL temporary occupied license land from the government to plant food so all the brothers and sisters start to ride bicycles to the empty land at one time which was a, a tin mine and after they mine the tin the people leave the area and then you use the land to grow food. I started learning to become a farmer around the age of eight. The land was not very fertile. It was this kind of tropical soil called the lateritic soil, very rich in iron and not many things can grow easily. So you need fertilizer and the only fertilizer that you can use or mainly pig manure, or chicken manure, cow manure or human feces. Cow manure we would go to the streets and try to collect them if we found anything on the streets and human manure at night. My fourth brother and I would get up at night around 2 a.m. carried some pails and went from house to house to empty their buckets and then in the morning carry that to the farm. Sometimes if the bicycle hits a, a bump, you get some spill on the back of your shirt, which is not very nice. We were glad that we could grow food and have three meals a day. <laughs> Mainly sweet potatoes, maize, very little rice. It was almost impossible to get rice. Clothing was tough. My mother knew how to sew and we have a sewing machine and she would mend and sew clothes for us. And, um, but uh, we, we live very uh, economically and trying to do the best that we could, but we have enough clothing to last through the war. <laughs> when we first moved back into our old house, my father decided that my fifth sister and I should go to Japanese school and so we went to a Japanese school which used to be a Chinese school with Chinese teachers 
rapidly trained to teach Japanese and every morning before school starts we would have to sing the Japanese national anthem Gimi Gayo and uh, then after that we would go back into the classroom and the teacher would start teaching us Japanese the Japanese language and learning Japanese songs and uh, and then after that we would come home and each time when we pass by the police station we have to count out to the Japanese soldier and uh, then after a while my father didn't see any sense in us continuing so he took us out of the school but then sometimes you know soldiers come around our area looking for women and whiskey and that's when trouble begins the main thing that people talk about is always the Japanese soldiers like to rape Chinese girls <laughs> and uh, or even force them to become mistresses that's what the stories went around in the area during that time but uh, I was too young to know too much about this at the age of eight or nine so and when they talk about such things usually my mother doesn't did not like me to be around to hear such stories and I remember in one at one time there was a Japanese soldier coming around and he was half drunk and he knocked at our door and we were all close in our door peeping out and uh, we did open the door and then when he walked out our neighbor's dog barked at him and he just pulled his sword and then chop off the head of the dog <laughs> that was quite an experience and uh, so we were all very scared of the Japanese I must say there was one incident in which after Chinese Qingming we were celebrating at home and having dinner steamboat all of a sudden one day a Japanese truck with soldiers came to the house and quickly came in and pulled my father out and took him to the Kempitai office it was around 6 p.m. at the time and we were all crying and did not know what to do we thought that he would never come back and uh, fortunately he didn't get, got, get tortured and he was questioned and um, his life was saved because the head of the Kempitai had a Chinese mistress and this Chinese mistress recognized and knew my father and she pleaded to the officer, the Kempitai uh, Kep man not to torture my father and after a long persuasion he finally let my father to return home quite late around 2-3 a.m. and uh, we were so fortunate we were happy that his life was safe that was safe. some people in town my father told me that it was probably one of the melee uh, people that collaborated with the Japanese reported the case to the Japanese company because my father was a very active Chinese business community friend and he also was a KMT member and he used to raise money to help Sun Yat-sen's revolution and so these were the kind of people that the Japanese loved to get and so that was the narrow escape that my father went through most important thing is for the younger generation to know the history to make sure that they have the right textbooks that tell the true story stories like the atrocities the comfort women story and the kind of uh, survival stories that people would have to tell you about the hardship and uh, you know nobody likes war and uh, war will always 
make people to feel miserable. You we we hear about the the Jewish Holocaust and uh, Hitler killed six million Jews, put them in the gas chamber. Well, if you add up all the killings in Southeast Asia, in the South Pacific and the Southeast Asian country, the numbers may be more than six million. And yet, the Japanese history books will not say anything about this. This is not the right thing for a modern uh, society to teach. It is important that the Japanese Ministry of Education should be open-minded and there's nothing wrong to tell them that they did something wrong and now they got to learn to see what lessons they could learn and let there be peace rather than any more city about militarism and about having power and then making nuclear weapons and trying to destroy the human race and they are um, concern about human welfare they should say where well, we should do something about that to teach people not to let this happen again canadian student does not know much about asia it's only until recently that through economic development the canadian international development agency started to send people help out to Asia to learn about the <clears throat> economics of Southeast Asia through development agencies. But without that, th this is a pretty comfortable, you know, country to live in, beautiful country. And um, the attractiveness of the multiculturalism here, they should learn more about the history so that they can have a better understanding before they can start trying to do trade with Asian people.